Hello, I'm mischievous Mark Giannacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Fantasy number 15, and all of the annuals, which I say do not count. And I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which I say count. But for me, Amazing Fantasy 15 remains a fantasy. Welcome to the Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. Thanks for joining us for this special Amazing Friends episode of the Amazing Spider Talk. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and 2099 future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review to help spread the word about our show. Yeah, this podcast exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep our podcast going until 2099, God help us, go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and consider joining our Patreon. Today on the show, we are fortunate to be joined by writer Steve Orlando, whose work has taken over and reestablished the 2099 line of comics. First starting with Spider-Man 2099 Exodus and continuing through Spider-Man 2099 Dark Genesis. And now, of course, Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099. Steve has also written the celebrated titles of Marauders, Scarlet Witch, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, Astonishing Iceman, and even on Amazing Spider-Man Curse of the Man-Thing. Uh, not giant size man thing though, Dan. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. just the curse of the he, and the curse of the man thing might be to have a giant size man thing, but we'll leave that for other scholars. Uh, <laughs> man, Mark, I have been loving Orlando's work on the twenty ninety nine series. I, I read that Spider Man twenty ninety nine Exodus, and his voice on this time era just just stood out immediately as a guy that like really launched into like sci fi writing. Um, I, I'm a big fan of sci sci-fi fiction, uh, sci-fi fiction. That's like saying ATM machine. But uh, I, I just his his dialogue and world building just is so unique and really reinvigorated the 2099 line for me, especially after that weird false restart that we had a few years back. So right. um, I know I've been gushing about him on the Substack, and I'm excited for a potential you know, for more for him. So I can't wait to talk to him on the show. Awesome. Well, we are definitely looking forward to it. So why don't we just jump right into it, Dan, and introduce Steve Orlando. Well, now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends. The kind of guy I go to other friends who recommend. Find out about the things they created. You'll love them so much that you wish you dated. But you're just friends. They're an amazing friend. A friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. All right. We are joined here by Steve Orlando. Steve, we, we, we introduced you in our in our intro as we should. So we're just going to get right into the questions here. Um, we, 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 we always kind of kick off interviews with our creators by asking them what's what's their origin story as it relates to comics and their fandom with comics. And, you know, since we are the amazing spider talk, we always want to know at what point does Spider-Man intersect with that uh, origin story, if at all? Well, it does. Uh, so if you're talking about fandom and me and me reading comics, especially, um, I, you know, as I was telling you guys before we hopped onto the recording, I'm from central New York originally. We didn't have, I'm from, I live, I grew up in Syracuse. Uh, we didn't have like a comic store on my side of town. You know, there was one in the city, but there, there wasn't one on my side of town for the longest time. So actually the first comic I ever bought, God knows why I remember this, even in my advanced age, but it was West Coast Avengers 16, uh, A Tale of Two Kitties. Um, I tell people I bought that in 1987, but I can cheat and look when it actually came out. Uh, but the point is, is that it's early on, um, for me, but it wasn't at a comic store. It was at a flea market, uh, cause my father was, uh, he, he used to run, uh, sports memorabilia shows. So I, and I did not really care about sports. So when we went to flea markets and things like that, I would always be looking for non-sports cards or of course, comic book type stuff, action figures too. So I picked that up. Now the internet tells me, whoa, that this was released actually in September of 1986. But this Ooh. book was almost definitely bought by me in 1987. And by by me, I mean my parents because I was two years old. So, <laughs> uh, so I read that and, and that was kind of what it was until the early 90s when we uh, finally got 
Well, actually, not even a comic book store. We got a Walden Books at my local at my local uh, enclosed mall, and uh, I started buying stuff off the spinner rack. So that's when Spider Man comes into play. I'm sure that I bought books with Spider Man in them in the '80s, but like, the first thing I remember, and actually the first comics I was buying close as possible to day and date, it was still off a spinner rack at a bookstore, not a comic store. Was uh, God love me? Uh, would have had to been like Clone Saga type stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, I was big into I was big into all of the twenty ninety nine books, which is convenient for me working on them now. But that was like nineteen ninety two, like Spider Man and the X Men were already the coolest. Shit. And like twenty ninety nine coming out, it was like wow, this is like cool. It made specifically for me that I can get into the ground floor of. So. But no, it was like the first things I remember buying, like off the racks specifically, were Ben Riley. Actually, Ben Riley was the Scarlet Spider. I, I don't, I don't know the issue number off the top of my head, but it's the issue where he, I believe, it's Web of Spider Man. Uh, he fights Venom and he separates Venom from Eddie using Impact Webbing, which he had created. So I was pretty much ground floor with Ben Riley, um, and I, and it's funny because. My entry point into Marvel was the Clone Saga, and my entry point into DC, again, as a day and date reader, was Electric Blue Superman. So it is actually kind of shocking in some ways uh, how deep my love for, for the form is, because both of those things are things I think were awesome, but it, let's at least say that they have a level of infamy uh, amongst amongst the reading populace. So um, Clone Saga was the, the thing for me, and... Um, and I also, you know what, I remember now that I'm talking about it, before Electric Blue Superman, my father did bring home from a show one of the Death of Superman comics. So, yeah. And again, like, kind of similar eras. Like, you know, it's always funny to me when Marvel and DC sort of orbit each other, you know, Batman dying and kind of coming back in the same way that Captain America did, so on and so forth. This would be later. This would be in the, whenever he, whenever they died, Final Crisis, mid-2000s. Right. But the point is, is... um. Both times when I got into both companies were times when the main person was not the star. Like, and, and I was young and foolish, right? So I was like, holy <laughs> Ben Riley's always going to be Spider-Man. <laughs> you know? And similarly, I was like, which of these people are going to be the real Superman? Now, I will tell you that uh, I had like an eight-year-old rationale for why it was definitely the Eradicator. Um, and, and that rationale was... And I, and I, you know, folks who read my books now will know that my plotting has not advanced much past this. Uh, my rationale was uh, that to come back to life, Superman had to fly really close to the sun, and thus he would have needed those goggles, those, that visor that the Eradicator has. So that was my hard proof that he was definitely the real Superman. And, you know, history proved me right. So that's great. <laughs> now, did your dad put you through college uh, by selling the Death of Superman issue? I mean, clearly. No, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the issue. It was... Um, I think it was the one that came in like the the black poly bag where he because the thing is like in, when you open the issue it's the one where Jonathan has a heart attack and he like a near death experience and he goes and he like sees Clark in the in the Kryptonian afterlife so it oh, wasn't yes. like the issue where he dies it was just part of that saga um, and so so yeah like it's funny that I that that I become here I am. And, and all of my jumping on points throughout life have often been what many people refer to as jumping off points. Uh, but but I'm still here. And by the way, I still f***ing love the Scarlet Spider original costume. As a matter of fact, one of the things I wear to the gym is a homemade version of that. Uh, I, and it's really easy to make because you just buy a normal blue Spider-Man sweatshirt and you cut the sleeves off. You can do the same thing in your Coolest home. person well, uh, at the gym. Yeah. I mean... Uh, well, you know, I'm not a virgin, so I'm doing all right. Like, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but sometimes that shocks even me. Uh, let me tell you. Um, you said, uh, 2099 was the coolest sh made just for you. Can you tell me about that? Like, uh, you know, what is it about 2099 that spoke to you early on? Well, I mean, I was seven years old in 1992, and so like, there's there's a there's an element of like KEWL cool that is very affecting to to, oh, yeah. to young folks, you know. Yeah. And and it helps that the books were way ahead of their time, like for the most part. If, when I go back and read uh, X Men 2099, um, you know, the folks working on that, Ron Lim and sh who who wrote it, I, I'm having a moment. Um, it's not it's not. I wish not, I knew. Uh, 
Yeah, I know. I and I used to know, but I just forget things. Um, oh, it's John Francis Moore. That's right. Um, and I was thinking, I you know, I was thinking a three na- three three le- three word name, but I was thinking Bill Messner Loeb's, but it's John Francis Moore. Anyway, like like way ahead of their time, the stuff that they were doing there is stuff that Grant would be picking up on in ten years in New X Men, and the same goes for Peter and Rick on Spider Man twenty ninety nine. You know, as um, well as we get closer to twenty ninety nine in the real world, I think the main Spider Man book uh, on and off resembles Spider Man twenty ninety nine more and more. That's not to say that they're the same character; they're absolutely not. They're very different, but you know. Peter, you know, for how many years did he have like a high tech job, you know, with, you know, with uh, whatever it was called, Parker Industries, Horizon Parker, Labs forget. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like he like the, the so I think so much of that stuff was ahead of its time. And there is just a little bit of lightning in the bottle there, too, because you can't really quantify cool like C-O-O-L cool. But it's just there, right? Like, like Miguel, the minute you see him, like that, that original Day of the Dead costume is, it's just a banger, you know, like it is, it looks intrinsically cool. It looks cool in the world that Rick and Peter built um, for so many, so many issues. It's one of the reasons when we did Exodus a couple of years ago for the 30th anniversary, we're like, he's going back in the, in the, in the blue and red. Definitely. Not that there's anything wrong with the Will Sliney costume. As a matter of fact, as you saw, we brought that back for flip side. But we had to go back to the classic. Um, so I and I think that for me, like, so when I say for me, I just mean in some ways, I just mean that like it's rare, especially in the '90s and '80s. Now it's very easy to buy a number one of a character because every character has thirty of them. But back then, you know, that was relatively rare. You, I was reading Spider Man, but when I was reading like Web of Spider Man or whatever, it wasn't issue one. It was issue who gives. A- and who remembers uh but like i this was like me it felt auspicious you know i get to buy this number one i get to be with this person day and day and i think that that especially when you're young um that's exciting you know it's uh and i still you know like the reason i put cassandra nova one of many reasons in marauders is because there's obviously many many great x-men villains but she was one where i was there for the first appearance like when i came back to x-men after years away um, it was for Grant and Frank Whiteley, and there she was in the first issue. So I think that, you know, those things sort of imprint on you, yeah. kind of like a baby velociraptor, you know, and you just, uh, you want to sure. follow those characters. So, yeah. um, and th- that's what it was for me. And the marketing for 2099 worked on me too, not just for Spider-Man and not just for X-Men, but like Ravage, a brand new character created by Stan Lee. <laughs> like I was like, holy <laughs> You know, like look at all these other ones he made that were so successful. This is going to be the same thing. Now, obviously, yeah. it was not, but um, you know, just like Ben Riley's not Spider Man at the moment. Uh, but but yeah, there's just there's a, there's an excitement to all that stuff, uh, and I and I was certainly right in the strike zone uh, for it. That's awesome. So so we're we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna jump ahead to the, your your professional career here because uh, I wanted to ask you about how. So obviously, when you when you were at DC, you launched um, Midnighter, and then you went on to work with other very popular characters like Batman, Justice League, Wonder Woman. Um, so, uh, can you talk a little bit about like the transitioning from DC to Marvel? What that change has been like for you? How it was like working with those legacy characters versus the characters you've been working with with Marvel now? I mean, is there a difference in approach, different in style? Like, what's what's like you know, your overall impressions of the two companies and how you've kind of gone back and forth? Well, this the tone is different. Like, like it's it, there. There are people who say that there'll be like Marvel style writing and DC style writing, but I don't necessarily agree with that uh, to an extent because, um, like there can be a tonal difference, and I think there is. You know, like like how many times do do you have assholes like me on a podcast and they say Marvel is the world outside your window and DC is the world as it you know like DC is the world as we you know what a lot of creators say not the world outside your window thing they say DC is the world as we wish it was. And Marvel's the world as it is, uh, and and so I think that there's always a tonal difference there. Marvel characters tend to be slightly more grounded, um, and the perspective has always been a little more humanistic. I think that speaks to when the vast majority of the line was created, which was of course in the '60s versus the '30s. Uh, not all of them, obviously. Uh, thank you, Human Torch, for killing Hitler, uh, but. <laughs> Most of them. So there is a tonal and a lens and a perspective difference. But I think 
if you try to subscribe to an actual like practical delivery difference too much, like like if there's a Marvel way of writing something and a DC way of writing something, the thing that's getting lost there is your way of writing something. So um, for me, it's mm -hmm. more, you know, the types of characters are different. Yes, like, like, you know, when Justice League came back to prominence in 1997, it was all about Grant and Howard doing the Greek pantheon. And for better or worse, that's not the Avengers. Like that's just not the, the four, that's just not the template. Yeah. You know, but that's how it was. That's how it's kind of always been for Marvel. Outside of obviously people like Thor and Sentry, these are heroes um, that would save the day. But then you also might be able to see them getting a latte, right? Because they are like they're they are just like you with something more. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Of course, you know, sort of what the core. In the same way that when you work on a character, our job first beyond anything else is to figure out what is the core of that character. Kelly Sue DeCona calls it the core wound. I'm not cool enough to say that, uh, but I do <laughs> But I do think you need to find out like what a character is about. And it's not even that there's a right answer, uh, one right answer, though there may be some wrong answers. Um, but you need to decide for yourself, right? But I think secondary to that as well when you're working in a shared universe is finding out what the thesis and what the world itself is about. So those things might be different with Marvel and DC, but on a day-to-day -day level, like we're still here to offer what we bring to the table to these characters. So you think about that, you remember the sort of like sky high pitch for the universe, um, but also like you got to deliver things that only you can deliver um, or before you know it, someone else will be delivering them. I don't know why I'm being uh, so coy with my phrasing today, but here we are. <laughs> it's like Fair a little enough. Dr. Seussian. It's like if Dr. Seuss like was just like a little bit white trash, that's kind of... <laughs> uh, I, I, am, I am here for all of this right now. Um... Ke Kelly Sue is cool and you're coy. That, that's what we're taking away, yeah. <laughs> yeah, core wound versus coy wound. Mine is like, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a thumbnail, but it really pisses you off. <laughs> uh, or rather a hangnail, a hangnail, pardon me. <laughs> um, can you talk to us about your involvement with the uh, Marvel Pride Anthology and overall what, what it's meant to you to bring... Uh, LGBTQT plus representation to mainstream superhero comics. Um, I mean, I so so I, it's I'd be quite honest. You know, my, the first time I went to a comic con and started trying to get work was in 1997. I was 12 years old. Um, and if you asked me then that it would even be possible now, I probably would not have thought so. So there is there there is a little uh, there is a little bit of uh, awe to that. You know, like I I always. Perhaps naively, I always kind of thought that I would get into comics because I couldn't think about doing anything else. I mean, I had a shoot job for 10 years before I was making a living in comics, but I never stopped. I mean, I, I must have quit a hundred thousand times, right? Like many people, but I still stayed in. So I knew, I mean, if, if I didn't think it was going to happen at some point, I probably, probably never would have happened. But I didn't necessarily think I'd have the privilege of telling stories uh, about folks like myself by any number of vectors. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of stories about assholes in comics. The Wolverine <laughs> is made in the cottage industry, but uh, not necessarily anything else. So um, it's a privilege, you know, like, and it's an honor and all those sort of trite things to say, but it's also true, you know, because instead of when I was younger, uh, having to sort of scrounge around for, 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 for stories about that said that folks like me could be heroes, uh, folks like me could be champions. Um, now, you know, there's, there, there's readers that don't need to do that, you know, and, and, and that's a process. Um, I was a big fan of the authority. Uh, of course I was because a character like Midnighter, albeit me not being a mass murderer, uh, <laughs> <laughs> talked and acted more like me than the type of representation that we got at the time, which was largely limited to like shit like Will and Grace. And there's nothing wrong with that show, by the way, but it just was not for me. I didn't see right. myself in those characters. Um, and then here was Midnighter, a guy who, yes, was f Apollo, but also was a cruel bastard, you know, which was much more about even my personality at 12. So... <laughs> I, I wish I, I, it's cute that you think I'm joking, but, uh, <laughs> no, I'm no a middle school that. teacher. Trust me. <laughs> I, I, I know. Yeah. Um, but so it, it's all those things. Uh, but the real thing is, that, you know, this year it'll be 10 years that I've been full time in comics and it's, 
it's great to be able to tell those stories. It's great to not only be able to tell those stories as well. Um, and the real privilege of having done it for a decade is that I can, um, I've been able to tell a lot of different kinds, right? Like I, I'm really happy you asked what the Marvel Pride uh, anthology was like working on because it was not the first time I got to work on something like that. It wasn't even the 10th time I'd got to work on something like that. But to me, that's actually the point that we get to keep telling these stories and then we get to tell more kinds of them, right? Like there's no, for a long time, the only kind of story we got is, hey, you get your head caved in at the end, right? Like mm -hmm. we all saw yeah. Brooke Mac Mountain uh, and I was like, sweet, what a life. Um, and then, and even things like, I can't even remember his name, but like for the, one of the, when Judd Winnick was on Green Lantern, there was this big thing because Kyle's friend Terry was gay, which is great, except Kyle's friend Terry is gay so they didn't get the <laughs> kicked out of him and Kyle can be big mad about it. Um, and you know, that does happen of course, but that shouldn't be the only story we get. So the real thing, like by the time we got to Marvel pride, um, it had been many, many pride anthologies, many stories featuring queer characters. And it actually is really nice to be able to tell sort of nuanced stories that engage with different aspects of the culture. I mean, Somnus is not like me in any way, other than the fact that he's Italian, um, you know, Somnus was created to, to to take advantage of the wish fulfillment that the Krakoan era offered characters in story. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we knew we knew the mutants could be resurrected, um, and we knew that death wasn't permanent for them anymore. And that's great for all of the X Men that had been like like conveniently hot mutants their whole lives, like Cyclops. But I wanted to take this time, and what we did with Somnus is talk about mutant elders, and, and by proxy talk about queer elders, right? And, and I think about, it's probably my favorite Pride Anthology story I've done, and by, it's mm -hmm. by no means the only one. But it's my favorite because it's not just about like, oh, here is a character that's gay and that's okay. It's, a, it, it's about much more than that. And it's a way for me to do, you know, tell stories that pay homage and, and honor the people around me that inspire me. You know, the, the Somnus came about because sitting on the porch of one of my neighbors who is uh, elderly uh, and, and, you know, I want, I sit there and wondering what it must be like for him in his seventies to sit and look at me and my fiance living a life that I'm sure he never thought he would be able to, you know, like, I mean, this is a man who couldn't look at my dog because his first, his first long-term partner would raise corgis and he died of AIDS mm. and they, you know, and it was so early in the era for folks who don't know that might be listening that we, the world didn't know what it was. So here's a man who died. Um, and, and my neighbor had to cart essentially his dead lover's body around because they couldn't even find a crematorium that would take it. You know, this is just horrific trauma. And to think about what could I do? Like if, if this were Krakoa, if this were Marvel, like he's a person that deserves a second chance. He deserves a person that enjoys to live in the utopia that he sacrificed for. Um, and so that's how Somnus came about. I can't do that for my neighbor, but in Krakoa, Akihiro can. Uh, and, and he can do that for someone. So it, it's, it's, it's always an honor to be invited to these anthologies, but I'm happy you asked about the Marvel one because it actually is my favorite one uh, that I've done because uh, it allowed me to talk about a lot more than just, oh, this character is gay, isn't that great? Yeah. Or, oh, this is about straight washing, let's punch it in the face. You know, um, if, if, I, if I were to go on a desert island with, with only one of these stories, at least now, it would be my Marvel Pride story. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you share that story with your neighbor? Uh, <laughs> well, I did, but it's worth noting that it's shocking or not to folks who listen to this podcast and read comics, what we think is normal and what is actually normal. Yeah. So I did share it with him, but I got about, uh, I think I got to explaining that Krakow and mutants come out of eggs now. And he was yeah. kind of like, I'm really like, I'm out. <laughs> I still don't think that's normal, but I'm enjoying it. You know, uh, fair enough. So Mark gets the really like, uh, like nice questions. And I'm, I'm going to get into 2099 here with the most important question you've ever been asked or anyone has been asked about the character. Is the suit blue or black? I think it's blue. Okay. With the note that many things in, that are in blue in comics due to tradition are actually black. 
but I still think it's blue. If you uh, had to have a character comment on his suit and say, that's a very nice blank suit, what color would you fill that with? No, I, I, I do think it's blue. Um, and that's not to say I don't, and, and, and that's different than what I want. Like I probably actually want it to be black. Uh, but I do think it's blue. Um, I think it's blue for the, for the reason that you were probably nodding for that for a long time, black got colored blue, uh, because it just was hard to show black in a four color printing era. Um, but I also kind of like if it, cause if it is blue and red, then it is both it, you know, it is a nod to Peter's costume. So I guess I do have to say I think it's blue, actually. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that so was, uh, that was a tough question, Dan. That yeah, was very tough. Hard hitting. <laughs> well, hard hitting. Honest, like, like, but as I said, now do I? What color do I think it should be? That's different. Um, but that probably has a lot to do with like I'm still angry we never got the Alex Ross uh, movie uh, Spider-Man costume from Wizard Magazine in like 1998, mm. which by the way was black and red. So anyway. the 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 only real follow up that that I should be asking you from that is like why don't you allow yourself to be happy and and just say it's black <laughs> like uh, like what 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 about you is keeping you from just saying it's black and moving on. If you, if you really want that. Uh, well, to be honest, because I'm not versed in, I like, I'm not versed enough to know which of these questions is going to make me have to create new words to mute on social media to avoid people. <laughs> like coming back out. So I'm just playing the odds here. I, why I why like would you assume we had that big of a listenership on this show? <laughs> but um, OK, coming coming into writing 2099, uh, you were follow, following up an attempted relaunch of the line. That, like, in my estimation, seemingly rebooted the continuity and, you know, uh, spearheaded by Nick Spencer and followed up in Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, when you came on to do Exodus, was there any discussion of continuing that reboot or was it quickly just determined that you guys would return to the regular continuity of 2099? Well, the real decision was not to play favorites. Um, and and I'll, and and... and well, I'll tell you uh, that that is because when we looked at everything, it was the 30th anniversary. Um, every comic is someone's favorite comic, uh, you know, with it, with the possible exception of, I don't know, take your take your whipping boy comic that I could come up with. One more day. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure that was someone's favorite comic. They probably worked on it, but still. I'm just trying uh, to save you on the internet. Say you don't like that. And uh, you will get a lot of support. Yeah. No, I actually, you know what? Hold on. There, there's a real answer for this. I, I recently discovered one of the most ill thought out comic titles ever. Um, so I will make fun of an actual comic that I discovered chaos comic published back in the day. And it was called f***ing lynch mob. So, oh, geez. uh, and this is real. Um, judgment was non-existent in many cases in the nineties. Mm. So yeah, like, but you know what? Even that is probably some idiot's favorite book. So, uh, <laughs> that being said, exactly our audience. Let me tell you so. that being said, um, yes. So you had the, I believe you're talking about Nick Spencer stuff. Yes. Uh, uh, so you had that, but you also had, I mean, you had Marvel Knights 2099, you had Donnie's thing that he did with 2099, um, of course, you had the original continuity. So one of the reasons for the 30th that we merged them all into Earth 2099 um, was so that if you squinted, everything happened. Mm. Um, and, and that's the best way I can describe it, because we didn't want to completely invalidate anyone's work. And, 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 and someone probably loved that stuff. So to us, we took the Grant Morrison approach of it all happened. Um, and, you know, Maybe it didn't happen exactly as you remember. That's why I say if you squint, because obviously characters, I mean, the Punishers died like three times. Um, <laughs> but it all happened, um, you know, and it's all there. So that was really important to us. And it was important to us as well in a practical reason. Um, you know, like currently, like, like you know, Earth, Earth, what is it? 928 was the original one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is, they're all Earth 2099 now, but it's also because we wanted to finally not act as though every single book that's ever been published takes place in one year. Um, again, like it's been 30 years. So we created Earth 2099 where all of these things were canon. 
um, in their way. And with the idea that much like the heroic age, that, like 2099, Earth 2099, this is the, the new heroic age that began in 2099 with the emergence of Miguel O'Hara. So he's like the foundational character there. Um, but we also wanted, yes, to not have to somehow like say to squint really hard and say that 30 years of comics happened in exactly one year, um, especially in an era when like technically like five years have passed in X-Men time. And I don't think that five years have passed in mainstream Marvel time. So, yeah. you know, it was just easier to uh, it was easier and more elegant for us to merge them as a way to celebrate everything um, as opposed to just sort of, as I said, like playing favorites, picking and choosing, because nobody wants to hear that this thing they love doesn't doesn't matter anymore. Instead, yeah. it all matters. Sure. Uh, so, so so jumping off that dance question there, you know, with with your approach to 2099, uh, was it always intended, you know, editorially to focus on some of these team ups and events early on to kind of help rebuild this world, reintroduce 2099, um, who maybe hadn't been exposed to New Wave of York the way you were back at the you know the spinner rack in ninety in the early nineties. I think so, uh, but the, the, but I would note that's also always the job in the same way that uh, well everybody some comic every comic is someone's favorite comic like anything we do is always going to be someone's first book so yeah like uh, it's always important for me. I, I have a, you know, I'm not perfect. Just ask comic book roundup. And uh, <laughs> one of those, one of those, the, the things, because I like, because I'm a person, if you want to talk about the comic section, comment section, because I'm a person who would read the Silmarillion over Lord of the Rings. Uh, I, I, I like a dry bit of jargon, right? But I, but I do uh, know that you really, that can become overwhelming. So like the approach was always uh, to, yes, be, not overly expository, but to be welcoming um, and to softly represent things uh, or at least present them in a fresh way because, you know, we had this this kicking off the first thing. We had this 30th anniversary platform and the mandate, as you've seen since then, has been to build the world out. This is why we're doing so many new characters and things like that and because it's fun to mash Miguel up against them, of course. Uh, but expansion, refreshing, that has been the mandate and uh, it's been an exciting one like i said and there's even more coming as you saw coming this year 2099 as the as the teaser as the teaser <laughs> said uh there's so much that they tell you guys in that teaser it's stunning it's really a lot to go off of yeah we're gonna come back to that in a moment um I, I, but on the point you're making i have loved your approach to world building uh in this universe you know uh, the minute your exodus came out like the voice, uh, your voice felt very fresh on, on the book. I love science fiction novels and a lot of the like world building felt like something from like a classic sci-fi novel that I can kind of get lost in. Um, and you've been doing a lot of things with like burning down the world, introducing zombies to like a huge part of the population, like erasing everybody's data and moon bases and things like that. Like, I'm curious to hear more about your approach to world building and even that grand plan for remaking the world of 2099. And in that note, how, how do you decide how bold you are going with reshaping this universe? Well, okay. So first of all, thank you. Because if I've done one thing, it has been to try to expand the cyberpunk influences and literary influences, obviously through the punch in the face lens, because I'm still me. Of, of 2099. I mean, the influence of things like Philip K. Dick and um, the, uh, the guy that wrote Neuromancer, William Gibson. William Gibson. I was uh, going to say, he, it just it, reads like that, in, especially in, in uh, your first miniseries. Well, thank you. It's, it's very well. And, and in a way, that's because I would say it's very strong in the original source material. Like I was I was saying how a lot of it was ahead of its time. When you go back and like I didn't come up with the card system, for example, I didn't, and I didn't come up with the idea that black cards were above the law. That's been there since the 90s. But that is more prescient than ever. Right. So we wanted to sort of elevate those influences and also, like, add more, to be frank. I mean, for, for the three people that noticed uh, they uh, in, the, in Exodus, um, I think it's Ghost Rider, but characters use the, the street jargon from Blade Runner, um, actually. Yeah. 
Um, I noticed. It, I was one of those three. <laughs> um, you know, which I which I've been hesitant to say because I don't even know if that's legal. But you know what? Fair use. Let's go. So, um, so there's things like that. Um, we try to allude to. I mean, I'm a big fan of. Well, as as you had said, science fiction outside of comics as well as in comics. So I do want to try to expand what we're nodding to. Um, you know, like the Dracula issue uh, that just came out. Um, I was really happy with where we were able to put vampires uh, because a it's kind of a swerve. You know, you you know, like you, it is. There's a little bit of protopia to 2099's dystopia in that you know people people they did find a good solution to vampires or at least a workable yeah. solution. <laughs> um, but also to be clear, like you know, I'm me and I can't if I'm working at Marvel, I can't not get a planet of vampires when that was an Atlas Comics book way 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 back in the day. Um, so I really appreciate all that um, because I'm you know sometimes you, people have only read comics and that's great. But there's so much more out there, so we should all do it all. Um, that being said, you you said something really good at the end. How do you sort of know how bold to go? And um, it's an ongoing question. The thing that I sometimes have to realize um, or remind myself of, because I was like, do we want to, like, for example, the Masters of Evil having like a spaceship and shit like that. But then at the same time, I sort of sat back and I was like, wait, people, people have spaceships and in the normal 616, like, like, tw like 2023. How so, about Black I, Widow having a giant gun that shoots at the moon? <laughs> that was, that was well, my favorite touch. It's a light transport gun. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pun, my favorite thing. But that's, kind of, but that's kind of what I realized. Like, if anything, I think we have to... I think that we've kind of been girding our loins too much with, like, spec fiction and futuristic things set within the Marvel or DC universe because look at what is the look at what is the the baseline in an avengers book it's totally normal for people to have like nanotechnology they have fucking teleporters why do we feel like it's weird and by, by we i mean me like it like why i had to do it like a personal inventory of why i wasn't sure if a character could have a teleporter in 2099 but then i was like again like they've had that since the 80s uh in in the present so if anything, I think the challenge is, you know, so much of science fiction and so much of the tropes of speculative fiction as well are based on our real world, when actually to do it in the Marvel Universe, you have to adjust for the baseline of, of that, of that in-story reality. And I think, if anything, we could go even wilder because of how much that is uh, sort of normal in day-to-day -day life in Marvel's present. Does that make sense? Because uh, totally. it's also kind of like... The challenge is like, oh, well, how do you just like think about things that aren't possible? Um, it's an ongoing challenge because we don't live there. So extrapolating is an ongoing challenge. It's the same as like when I was on Martian Manheim with Riley Rossmo. Our sort of mandate for everything we did in culture building was, well, are we approaching this because it's what's right for Mars or are we approaching this because it's familiar to us as humans? But the catch 22, of course, is we are humans. Uh, so, so how do you not think like one when you're, when the equipment is, is standard issue human? So, um, I think it's similar with 2099. If anything, we need to go even bolder because we got to remember all the time what's normal for someone who works, you know, at a coffee shop in the Marvel universe and people teleporting in from Asgard or the future, that's all normal. Mm -hmm. So how much weirder would it really be? And what would the baseline be like 70 some odd years in the future? Um, I actually think that we need to push it even further, if I'm being honest. I always think about that one random issue of Amazing Spider-Man where Peter is working at Horizon Labs and invents like the solution to cryo-freeze. And, and it's like, that would be universe changing level. And here's a guy can't get a job. And he invented like... Like he would save Walt Disney's head, you know, like, uh, and, and, and we're just treating it like normal. And, and then we go into the future and they have flying cars and it's like, is that much more advanced than being able to freeze organic matter? I, I, I don't know. Well, that's a good point because that would be a good example of something we think is futuristic that is not because people have flying cars in shield right now. Well, mm -hmm. right now, you know, right. Um, so yeah, that's the challenge. It's a perfect example because we are kind of like Jetsons flying cars, a little dot on your head that we don't know what it does. And, uh, but you know, we already have most of that stuff. Yeah. So it is, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think anything is too weird for 
$20.99. But I do think you want to keep the feel to bring it back around. Like, mm-hmm. it can be... The baseline can be even bolder in Stranger because of what's normal in present-day Marvel. But I don't think you ever want it to look... It still has to look and feel like 2099. It's still got to be dusty. It's got to be smoky. It's got to be neon. These cavernous cities. Um, it you don't. It can't become Coruscant. It can't become you know Earth, the Earth of Star Trek or something like that. In in that regard, do you think like I think about Back to the Future all the time, and I know nobody ever wants that to be remade. But kind of what's interesting about Back to the Future is it's <laughs> like a projection of how the 1980s sees the 1950s and sees the 2010s. So if you were to remake it now, it'd be, it'd be kind of interesting to see how we, uh, fan, you know, fantasize about the future or, or, or see doom about the future and, and have nostalgia about the past. Do you see 2099 as kind of like a, some way trapped in Amber nineties vision of what 2099 would look like instead of like what 2024's vision of what the future would look like. I think the the impossible goal, honestly, is to make those Venn diagrams a circle. If you really want my answer, <laughs> yeah. And and, if, and by the way, like if we could do it, we would have solved nostalgia, right? And like so, so <laughs> no one can. But but what I mean by that is you want like on some level, yes, the look, the feel, the way people talk, the fact that everybody says shock, shock instead of and jam instead of damn and bit instead of. Um, it's great for getting things past S and P, but it does feel a little, uh, of its time. Uh, but at the same, by the same token, if something is in Amber too long, the, the, the audience will just dwindle because that audience only lasts as sure. long as people who have nostalgia for it are, are within the consumer base. So that's what I mean. You kind of want to press them together. You need it to feel like it does for the diehard people and also to respect the, the core creative of the line. But then also you got to sort of ha- somehow somehow find a way to serve that to new people. Um, I think that's what we're always trying to do. And that is, I think, one of the reasons, like, yes, we're keeping the, the big influences of 2099, but we are expanding them. We are mm-hmm. sort of build, building it out. We're doing books with different flavors, I hope. You know, um, I, I have yet to figure out how to do, like, my 2099 version of Event Horizon, but stay tuned. Um, <laughs> you know, like... In the ones in the in the stuff that they tease, which I can't really talk a lot about, but I'll see what you ask me. Like, I can speak obliquely about the influences of the books because I'm a weirdo. But you know, like in one of them, we got to do what is the 2099 version of like a Christopher Marlowe Faust story or like a Goethe Faust story. So like we are want to expand the types of things we tell with the lens, um, but the lens is still the lens. Otherwise, you know, what separates 2099 from like the wasteland? universe whatever or like right. like au or whatever that's called or so on and so forth so um yeah it's it, it it is it is the constant struggle we're all trying to do but hopefully as i've said you know we are doing it well with 2099 um i don't want i mean obviously like like if i wrote and if we presented uh the line exactly the same as as you would get it like under peter and rick um, things would never grow. So I, you know, like my hope is that what we do honors all that stuff. And, and that goes for, that goes for Peter and Rick, that goes for Ron and John Francis. Um, it goes for everyone who created these characters, but we also have to evolve it. So hopefully it, this work rhymes with that work. But if I was writing the exact same sort of world and voice for Miguel as Peter, well, that's what he's there for, right? So we have to offer new things. And by the way, we are getting Peter back as well. I've read all. I've read the entire miniseries in March, uh, for Symbiote Spider Man twenty ninety nine. So we're getting we're covering all bases. We're covering all flavors. Awesome. Um, I, I there was something you you alluded to. You, you know the the Marlowe story, and I, I I wanted to ask you kind of more broadly. You know something that that we have talked about and really appreciate in you in is how you have managed within these these minis and events to really effectively tell done in one stories uh, within, within these arcs. Um, and I, I want you to talk about what I consider is the lost art of the single issue story. Cause we, <laughs> we, just, we just don't get these anymore. And I, I love them. I, you know, I wish other media would do more of the single issue or the single episode stories. So, so, so what, same what with your you... Scarlet witch too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so, so I mean, is it, do you consider this a lost art and, and why, are, why are you able to do it? <laughs> well, I can't, well, I can't, well, I can't say it's a lost art now because if I'm the only one that is able to do it, because then I just sound like a, a big old chode. I can't lie to you. Um, <laughs> but I think that it is a cl more classic, you know, like we're talking about when I was picking up books in the eighties and nineties and, and the fact that every book is someone's first book. Um, the goal is, yeah, like, like it's not that in, in the things you brought up, we did set out to do done in ones for a variety of reasons, but in a thing like Scarlet, Witch, especially it is like, we wanted that. Yes. We kind of don't do it anymore, but that's because, uh, it's any number of reasons, but we wanted to, we wanted to not just do something that's sort of classic, but for the reason it was successful when it was classic, as you said, like you get a full story, you know, everything you need to know about the character. Hopefully there's a tease for more, which we always try to do a little bit as well. You want more, but you don't, uh, you don't want to sell something that's incomplete. And I think, you know, things go in phases. Um, when I was first buying comics, this was kind of the norm, 80s, early 90s, uh, especially if I was buying back issues from the 70s and things like that. Then we realized, holy shit, decompression, late 90s, an issue of someone drinking a soda for $5. This is amazing. Um, and I think that has become kind of the expectation now. And the minute something becomes the expectation, you have to buck the expectation. So with Scarlet Witch, it was we were reestablishing Wanda in sort of a new page one uh, for her. We wanted it to be as welcoming as possible. Um, and with 2099, um, there have been a lot of different reasons that we've done one shots. Uh, but I do think it's, it's nice uh, to be able to give that complete package to people, especially as books become more expensive. Um, and as to why am I why do I do it? Like, is it a lost art? Um, it's a different muscle and, and it's hard, you know, like, cause here's the thing, uh, when, when people ask me about breaking in and ask me about writing, um, sometimes people get sort of down that the, you're often your first work as a creator is only like eight pages or six pages. And, and that's true. You know, the first things I did, um, were eight page stories at image. And then there were eight page stories at DC and vertigo and things like that. But the point is, is that it's actually the reverse. And I tell people this on the breaking into comics panels and things like that. It's much harder to tell a complete story in six or eight pages than it is even in 20. So by that token as well, if we're used to doing two parters, three parters, four issue arcs, so on and so forth, you have to sort of buckle down and, and be more utilitarian and efficient and creative with your space to do a full story in one issue. But at the same time, uh, and it is harder, uh, you know, as I said, there's, there's, there's less, there's less fat to trim, but the payoff again, folks get complete stories. They feel welcomed in. And the thing I said else, uh, otherwise is not a joke. Like these books are getting more expensive all the time. And I do really feel like folks deserve as much as possible in every single issue. Oh yeah. So appreciate that. Um, uh, so not only are you delivering the goods, but you've been working with some incredible artists. Like I, I have a piece from Justin Mason on my wall here uh, from before he was even working in uh, 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 professional comics. Uh, and it's uh, one of my favorites. So to see him team up with you to deliver one of the most horrifying visions of carnage I, I've, I've ever seen was <laughs> really exciting. Um, and then your work with Dev Malia uh, on, um, on that first issue of the Miguel O'Hara with the zombies was just a visual stunner. Like that, that might be my book of the year already, uh, between both of your work. Um, what, what's your co collaboration style like with artists? You've worked with so many on, on these various, uh, mini series, you know, do you change it up with each of them? Do you have a particular way you like to work? And do you have any highlights from the time working with these names? Yeah. Well, so the, the thing is, is that you always do want to change it up and you want, but you want to change it up according to the, uh, what is going to be most exciting and best for your collaborator. So it's not like I sit down to a book and I'm like, fuck it today. I'm only writing an iambic pentameter and you're like, no, like <laughs> you should, um, you should say that, <laughs> you know, like now my scripts will be bulleted lists. No, like, uh, no, that, but, but what you do is when you start a new book, you, you, you talk to 
if you if you have time, which is some, sometimes not always a luxury, you have that conversation. You see what type of uh, script style, what type of things they want in a script. Some folks want very little, and they wanna they wanna put a lot in, like uh, of, from their own sort of inspiration. Some folks want the opposite because deadlines are tight and they want to know exactly what's got to be there. They want to hit it and they want to move on um, and everything in between. So in a perfect world, like you are, you are switching up, not necessarily your script format, but what you put in it, how you deliver it uh, based on a conver that, uh, that conversation. When that isn't always the case because things are on a tight deadline, um, yeah, you want to use, I try to use a style that is relatively open and also make sure that the folks I'm working with know that like these books are conversations. I at least am not a person who considers myself in charge of a story. I do consider myself the first, you know, person holding the baton. Uh, but like we're a team. Uh, so, and that does mean sometimes leaving things open to interpretation and giving your collaborators room to work. So, um, at minimum, you know, I, you take a look at someone's work and you give them room. You try to not overcrowd the page. These are all really tactical answers, but you want to give them room to do what they're going to do best and know that it might not be exactly what you're imagining. Um, but that to me is the risk and amazing reward of being in a collaborative medium. If I wanted complete control, I would be writing novels. Uh, so, um, I try to, yes, like treat my, the people that I'm working with as true peers, as true teammates and, and give them room to do what they do best. Um, and you know, I think it shows through as, as to, you brought up Dev Malia, it's probably one of my favorite books I've done in this series. Um, and as you had said, like it came back as a surprise, you know, I don't like, I don't do a lot of layout description, for example, uh, because, it's not that that isn't something that writers can do and some do it, but to me, if I didn't trust like the person I'm working with yeah. to do what they do best, what am I here? So that's a good example. Like I might write a five panel page, but unless something is vastly important, how that, you know, the size of those panels, how it comes out, I try to leave that up to folks. Stuff with Dev Malia, I, I could never have predicted the way he was going to tell that story. He was perfect for that. It's one of my favorite, like I said, one of my favorites, along with the X-Men issue from Exodus. Uh, that's probably the only one that's ahead of it. Um, Kim Jacinto, I, I was just like, my face was melting when I saw those pages and those designs. So, and I would work with them again in a second. Um, but in both cases, yeah, in, in all of them, like the artist is your first audience as a writer. So I think you want to give them as room to shine. And also to be frank, you want to make sure that the book you're doing is exciting to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that, that comes through hopefully in the pages, uh, from folks that I work with. Um, and, you know, as a note, like, if you can't have that conversation, sometimes what's exciting to an artist is going to surprise you. Like, rest in peace, but Steve Dillon relatively famously really liked doing Talking Heads, you know, which is the converse of yeah. uh, most artists, right? So <laughs> um, those conversations can be fun. But listen, if you keep them excited, you give them room to work, I think that's what always makes the best work come back to you and then, you know, go out to print to you folks. Got it. Um so Marvel's been experimenting a lot with doing these like short term minis that are then being considered part of longer runs. Like, for example, you wrote what was the hundredth legacy issue of Spider-Man 2099 as part of your latest miniseries. Are you able to speak to this approach for the publishing line? And, you know, does it change anything for you as a creator to work like within miniseries to miniseries versus a sustained run of, of a title? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to comment on um, other than to say that I think that I'm trying I'm trying to find the the good answer here. I think it's reflective of the way, you know, the way publishers see the buying audience, right? Like publishers do what well gets the best return and reaction from their customers, which is retailers and and readers. Uh, so I think they see that if we do like like if we do an ongoing Miguel book that if if we do issue one to five issue six to ten issue and so on and so forth, um, the same story in those right now for better or worse is going to sell better if it's released as issue one to five issue one to five issue one to five rather yeah. than three arcs, um, and 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 that's again for for better or worse regardless of where you stand on it. 
currently that is a fact. And as long as that is going to be a fact, um, as long as that's what the the buying habits as of the mass ba of the mass customer base are showing publishers, that's what's going to happen because they obviously want to make as much of a return as possible on these books so that we can keep making them. Um, and I think that's the best way to talk about that because it's not like, you know, we don't sit in the lab and be like, what will torture people who aren't collecting? <laughs> uh, um, what I, counts? And, and for that note, I'm very, you will never hear me say anything else. Like, I wish things were legacy numbered. At minimum, I wish you got both. I would love if things had an arc number and and the legacy numbering so and, I, and i'm not shy about that i would because my first book was a random issue as i said at the top of this interview like to me that's always been part of the joy um but so so there's that um and then as to well as to us it's just different i i it's hard to develop subplots and, and things when you only have set arcs um but you know it's not better or worse. It's just different, you know, like doing these things, doing series of, of minis that are one to six issues long, four to six issues long, pardon me. Um, the, you know, that's, that's like appointment TV storytelling, right? Like when you, when you see a six episode series or a 13 episode prestige series or whatever, like character arcs are drawn in a certain way, events happen in a certain way. And that's what you're doing there. What you don't see are these long simmering, uh, subplots like you get in in network shows that I, I I hate that I'm using this metaphor but it does work like net net network shows that run like 22 episodes per season so it's not that it's better or worse but it is different how you deliver the story is different and and there are things you that you struggle to do if you're doing an event book you know like I would love to dig more into Miguel's relationship with Conchata I would love to dig more into his his previous and supporting cast outside of Spider-Woman who we created um but that's not the type of thing that happens when you are having to do an event book like and, and by which I mean like the big classic blow up like you got with Exodus or Dark Genesis which is basically Maximum Carnage 2099 um you know look at the look at the things we're homaging people are in costume almost the entire time so it changes the type of ways you deliver a story it changes the types of stories you tell um I think we all sort of long for at least like, you know, a, a two year run on something so we can have longer, longer simmering things. But, um, you know, when it happens, it happens. And we've been very lucky uh, to do as much 2099 as we've, we have done. And we've been really lucky on Scarlet Witch as well to, by the time everything that we're doing is done at minimum, I think we'll have the longest run, actually. I think we'll have the lo longer than the 18 that we got in the 2018 series. Mm. Um, so, uh, but uh, that being said, I would love, I wish, I would love to have the legacy numbering. I would love to have that all there because, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what books were like when I was younger. It's funny to think about, um, you know, in our lifetime, we went from Crisis on Infinite Earths. How could we ever do a new number one ever? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what will we do and now it's just like oh it's you know it's it's uh it's uh it's ambush bug you know yeah. volume 17 and number three so <laughs> anyway uh, i uh we could spend a whole podcast just unpacking why that is and what changes in the industry have led to to that being uh, uh such as it is um so in that we ended this mini series uh this past week um and in the back of that issue number five it, senior editor Mark Panicia, whose name I'm probably uh, butchering. Oh, you're doing all right. Oh, you're okay, right. great. Uh, uh, he announced more 2099 coming this summer, and that was the extent of it. Just a big 2099. I, you've already said there's not much you can say about it. I, I, I guess I would ask first and foremost, are you involved in these plans? Because your name wasn't included. And then... Is this more of what we've been getting? Is it an extended run that you could say you're doing? I mean, can you tell us anything about what that might be or even the ballpark of what we should be thinking about that could be? Um, yeah, they really didn't give me much to riff on here, did they? Uh, although there is, is it in outer I... space. That's, it's, it's a background with stars and that... 
letters is twenty ninety nine in the title. Are we getting Warlock twenty ninety nine? Well, I, I I did say that there's a cl- visual clue on that ad, and there's not much on that ad. I guess is all I would say to uh, your comment there. Um, and as to my involvement, I could only say I seem to have knowledge, don't I? Uh, <laughs> fascinating, so, fascinating. Um, but I will say that, like, I don't want to skip over it. So, so that's all I can really say. Although I, I, I would happily answer random yes or no questions um, uh, that play fair. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I don't want to skip over the fact that what Roger and Peter are doing in March is, is also everybody should check it out and, and is going to be like a great, I mean, as we push 2099 forward, it feels like a lost run from like the, the the kickoff era in the 90s. It's a great book, so folks should definitely check that out too. Before whatever's happening with the 2099 in a star field in 2024 arrives, that you All seem right. to know something about, and and I, I do want to note, like Disney has uh, the the rights to Star Wars, so like I'm really hoping for that Star Wars 2099 crossover book. That uh, seemed you've written both, so you're the perfect guy. Yeah, I mean, I've also written Power Rangers. Um, well, it's not it's not a Star Wars crossover. I'll tell you that. That's the yes or no that I wanted the answer to, and there it we seems go. I've there got we go. it. Yeah. All right. But Bef- be- before we completely uh, torture you, Steve, we, we-, we want to end our interview with a-, a question or I guess a variation of a question we ask all of our guests on this show, which is what has it meant to you personally to write a character like Miguel O'Hara and to add to his mythology? Uh, I mean, writing a character that was influential to you when you were younger is uh, always, always a really great moment. Like I, I, Obviously, like this is a job, so you and a part of our job is 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 finding out why a character is amazing, you know, regardless of if you know them or not. When you when you step onto a book, research is part of the job. Um, but with things like, I mean, well, things like things like Midnighter, you know, like working on a character that again was just so foundational to me, working on characters which are like Miguel, which are like Cerebra, like the launch characters from from twenty ninety nine. Um, it's surreal, you know, uh, and, and I, I tell the story in other podcasts, but 2099 specifically for me is surreal because, because of what we've already talked about that I was an issue one day, one reader for Miguel and for the X-Men. Um, but what I often say that I haven't yet is that, I mean, I've been trying to break into comics. I was trying for a long time. And in fact, I was already trying to, uh, in 2002, which was the 10th anniversary. And at that time, I was, uh, you know, Grant was on X-Men with, with Frank and uh, Casey and Ian Churchill were on Uncanny. And I was just like, oh, I love X-Men, but I can't pitch something. Like, what could I possibly pitch in the present that, was, that, that wouldn't step on what these two amazing writers are doing? But you know what they're not doing is 2099. <laughs> so I pitched... I have somewhere on like probably a hard disc, I have a, uh, a, a 10th anniversary 2099 pitch for X-Men that I, that I send into some very patient editors at Marvel. Uh, and so it's not just surreal because I'm working on Miguel, but I'm actually doing, like I did the 30th anniversary of a thing that I like shot my shot at when I was, uh, however old I was in 2002, uh, a teenager, like, like desperate, hoping that I would someday get in. So it's extra surreal, um, and with Miguel specifically, it's just been uh, it, it's been fun to explore the ways he's like Peter, and fun to the, explore the ways he isn't. He's a little meaner. He's a little more like me, uh, and and it's not just that. I mean, I I mean, I get to. You know, in the same way that we talked about Somnus, I get to put things into his character and speak to aspects of his culture that, yes, involve a lot of research, but also honor some of the people that are closest to me in my life, you know, that to whom Miguel is a huge hero and, and has been since they were kids. So, um, I mean, I'm proud to do it. I, I, I love the character and, you know, it, it'll continue to be a privilege for as long as they have me on board, which, you know, may or may not be in 2024, later in 2024. And there you have it. Speculation aside, everybody, or speculate on uh, that seems to be 
an interesting topic for conversation. Anyway, um, Steve, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We're a big fan of all you're doing in 2099 and, uh, and hope you will continue to do in 2099, uh, whether you choose to believe what you're saying or not. Uh, so thanks again <laughs> for, for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. You got it. Well, that was incredibly fun, Dan. You know, it was funny. Before we, we got on the air here, you described uh, Steve to me as like, I, he, he strikes me as a writer's writer. And, and he was very much that and so much more. Uh, I think he hit the, spe- the sweet spot for both of us in terms of his general style. So I, I He mean, referenced just, William Gibson, and that made him a winner in my book. I'm a huge fan. Go. So there you there go. There you go. So I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as we did talking to him. But alas, it is that time, time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning into this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. And of course, an extra special thanks to Steve Orlando for coming to talk to us about all of his 2099 work and then some. Yeah, this podcast exists because of listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these reviews the same week the comics release, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So a thank you to everyone who already supports us and the work that we do. Dan and I really want to increase all of the awesome work that we do in 2024, including more interviews with modern creators. So if you are already a patron or want to become one, please help us meet our goals and make this a better podcast by considering supporting our show. Just go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and click on the big Patreon button to get started. So Mark, until we load ourselves into a giant gun and fire it at the moon so we can invade the crypt of an Egyptian god, what's our motto? What the shock? With great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Don't, don't miss the next installment.